show, Five Shark Fam. I'm AJ, and this is Michael. Before we get into it, become part of the notification squad by hitting the bell next to the subscribe button on YouTube. Welcome to another episode of Five Stripe Weekly, and Atlanta United's preseason has begun. 20... Ooh, 2024. Yes, it's uh, officially the, the start of it, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of players that have already hit the camp. Uh, there are a couple of stragglers with their international teams. But before we get into all of that, uh, shouts out to our Patreon fam. Uh, you guys know who you are, but uh, we'll name you guys anyway because we love you. But Gavin Marshall, Jordan Beck, Nal Faruqi, Andrew Oki, and Chris James, shouts out to you all. But also, uh, like we mentioned uh really right before this uh yeah we're on that road to 10,000 subs help your brothers out and uh yeah get on that sub if you have not already we've noticed that a lot of you guys uh, that are watching aren't even subbed how explain just sub it's okay <laughs> but anyway guys let's get into the 2024 preseason and how it's begun uh well it began with LA United uh, hopping out of their cars and uh, into the bends like drip kings. Like, whew, these guys, they're looking, uh, they're looking swazzy. They're looking. It looks like some of them never left France. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Yorgos Yakumaki's with a turtleneck with a leather jacket. He's got the, you know, the bag for his, uh, you know, everything else, uh, you know, do up his hair, face, everything. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, as always, uh, Tristan Muyamba just pff, decked out. Uh, Burberry you know, jacket. <laughs> Burberry jacket. Uh, Shonda Silva with the uh, uh, the full body uh, sweatpants and sweatshirt hoodie look. I mean, yeah, I, I can't drip as hard as these guys, man. It is difficult, I think. But uh, not many of us can. We're not, uh, <laughs> we're not on the runway. Per se, but but uh, yeah, it is the runway to the season, of course, though, and uh, that uh, preseason uh, fixture list has been announced. And uh, you, you like that transition, yeah? Uh huh. I know you do. I know you do. But <laughs> the uh, yeah, so Birmingham Legion, they're the first up on January 27th. Uh, it will be a live stream uh, in Athens. Memphis 901 will also be played on February 3rd, and then there will be closed games against CF Montreal, Tampa Bay Rowdies, and Sporting KC. So uh, definitely uh, very interesting that uh, it's mostly, you know, USL sides or MLS sides. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's maybe not the hardest preseason that we've ever seen, but uh, it looks like, uh, I think there's maybe rumors that Apple TV is maybe going to do that documentary with the box to box films uh, in Florida, and that's where the you know the end of the preseason will end up. So it seems like there might be some things brewing down there. Have all the teams around each other in sunny Florida makes sense. But uh, but yeah, that preseason fixture list. Uh, anybody stand out in particular in terms of clubs that uh, might be kind of that tasty fixture that would be a good test for LA United. The only one is going to be SKC. Um, they're the only one who's a playoff level team, really. Um, and even then, it's a bit of a stretch. I mean, yeah, they made it, but, you know, they had a, a rough season. They rallied towards the end, um, made a bit of a run. Um, I, 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 If anyone's going to give us any kind of a, a challenge, it's going to be them. I and mean, really, it should only be them. If we're challenged by any of the other teams, even CF Montreal, I think that that's a little worrying because um, none of those teams really, in my estimation, um, have what it takes to press us to, to really, you know, push under pressure. So hopefully we can make it out with successfully handling all of these tasks in the preseason, because as Yargo said in his recent interview, preseason is 30 percent of getting ready for the whole season. So, like, um, you know, it's you get a really good preseason in that's like. 30% of the job done. So if it has that much value to him, I am expecting them to really show up and to really do well. Um, I mean, obviously don't need to win these games. It's not super important in terms of scoreline, but what's super important is how the team works and gels together and they look good and they're feeling good and they're playing well. 
Um, and hopefully that translates into a really strong beginning of their season. Indeed. Yeah, that's a great point about the uh, 30% that uh, Yakumakis said. Uh, it might seem arbitrary, but I mean, it is. Uh, I think it makes sense. I think it's uh, something that, uh, yeah, he went on to say that uh, this offseason was absolutely needed for him anyway, because he's been playing since the summer of 2022. Uh, so pretty much, yeah, almost two years straight. Um, yeah, more or less. And then, uh, yeah, he also noted that he was feeling good, but his body just needed a break. And uh, he's been researching ways to improve his game, i.e. technical stuff, like uh, his running <laughs> gait and what's best for his body, which, uh, yeah, uh, Michael knows a little bit about that at the moment. So uh, also... <laughs> for other things because uh yeah track star a little bit michael but uh the Not uh, a track star just doing a lot of <laughs> just trying to get back in shape that's all yeah but um uh, but yeah and uh yakumakis he said uh having the entire preseason to work with guys is so crucial pointing out how it builds chemistry and when they can train talk about it and then all hang out together so yeah that 30 percent came from that quote and uh, yeah, definitely fascinating. I mean, uh, how he put a numerical percentage on that, but uh, hey, you know, it's uh, I think it's this like Yakumaki's, uh, you know, he's just a closet nerd. We just uh, we didn't Maybe. know he's a mathematician. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, right. who's to argue with the future Golden Boot winner? So. Right. Oh, calling it already. Love it. Love it. I'm not. He's calling it. He's well, yeah. not calling it, but he said it's his goal. <laughs> It did, it did. But, uh, but yeah, so, uh, yeah, moving on from that, uh, I mean, yeah, we'll continue on with the preseason talk, but a uh, quick little tidbit is that Doug Roberson re uh, reported that there will be open stadiums for the Revolution and Charlotte games so far. Interesting that they will be those games. Uh, Charlotte, I understand, uh, very close, uh, you know, fans can hop over, that's not an issue, but Revolution, perplexing, that's uh, yeah. usually not a team that uh, draws very well, not a team that's particularly uh, the biggest fan base either, nor and do we, they think we don't, they travel well. But. And we don't really have like, it's not like a grudge match or anything, like this isn't a team that we have like a significant history like a bad history with so i don't really know what the draw is for this <laughs> it's uh it's an odd one but uh you know it, it could just be you know the day that it is and you know okay well fair enough then but uh but yeah moving on from that uh it was announced last week that stian gregerson uh he is officially an la united player uh he was signed through the 2027 season and with an option for 2028 so quite a number of years uh, three with a four uh, fourth year as an option but uh, yeah it was reported from several sources but Tom Bogert uh, especially that the fee was around two million and uh, Bocanegra he mentioned that uh, Stian he's been a consistent performer across multiple leagues and is comfortable defending with space behind him as well as in an organized block and so, yeah, definitely, uh, and sorry that, to misspeak, that's a four-year with an option for fifth. Uh, yeah, I am not an Asian that's good at math, so uh, yeah, there it is. That's uh, much better maths. Uh, but yes, yeah, the type of player that he is, I mean, definitely seems like something that we need, yeah? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, this guy, um, we need, like, you need someone to fill Miles' shoes. Miles was a guy who is a you know we call him the pressure relief valve he can get back he can stop counter attacks because that's the kind of thing that teams tend to throw at Atlanta United most regularly um he has the pace he has the size he has the and the most importantly he has the experience he considers this kind of his speciality of sorts he at Bordeaux you know is a, it's a big club in the second tier um and so a lot of teams sit back and play low against them um kind of almost similar to how like you know yorgos talked about when he came here from celtic team sat back against celtic because that was the big club in that league too and he was kind of an expert at unlocking those low blocks um similarly with this but on the opposite side of things he understands the defensive aspect of getting back and stopping counterattacks from teams that are pinned um this is obviously crucial for us 
it's one of the main reasons teams score against us. It, we see it frustratingly often um, when we have defenders who aren't able to, you know, put out that type of fire. Luis Abram is not a pacey big guy. He's not going to be able to do that. So we're going to really need to rely on Stian Gregerson to be able to do it. So hopefully uh, he'll be able to do He seems like he'll be able to do it. I mean, this guy almost looks like he was the captain for a little bit on Bordeaux before he came here. Um, guy's got leadership capabilities. He's a seasoned expert. Um, you know, I'm feeling really comfortable with him. And like we were saying in previous episodes, we're glad that he's not coming in on like a DP or anything like that. Um, you know, the, the long contract, this and another one we'll talk about, um, allows for them to be high tameable players. So um, good bit of business. Um, this guy seems like he's going to stick around for a while too. I really like that. We need to stop. We need to kind of get away from this, you know, like uh, buy low, sell high, get them out the door real quick. Or like your team wins MLS Cup and you sell the whole team. Like needed some consistency, less turnover. Get the fans to kind of know who these players are a little bit. Grow a little bit of fondness to them, um, you know, um, and then they can kind of become household names similar to what we've already had on the team. So, you know, I'm really looking forward to this business model and these types of players that are coming in because of this new direction and um stan is a great uh example of this and we have another one coming down the pipe too that i believe can be just as uh just as useful indeed indeed and we'll get to him a little later in the show but uh yeah uh stan gregerson also spoke with the media and he mentioned that uh, quote, Atlanta is an amazing club. They have an ambition to win. The stadium also brought me here, and the fans are fantastic. Uh, and he said, yeah, he's hyped to get started. And he's waiting on his visa, but he's training by himself for now. Uh, he does speak English, French, Norwegian, and he described himself as a leader and very vocal, strong in the 1v1, and has lots of pace. So, uh, yeah, definitely someone that uh, seems like a very good fit. Uh, 28 years old in his prime. So, yeah, a player that, uh, yeah, we can build into, uh, you know, further in his prime and has got oodles of experience. Has played with the likes of Martin Odegaard and, of course, Erling Haaland. So, uh, yeah, definitely fun stuff uh, coming about, I think. Uh, in terms of uh, players incoming. Uh, now, as well, uh, talking about uh, when, yeah, Carlos Bocanegra, he was uh, announcing Gregerson, uh, there were some other things in the press conferences uh, with the preseason, uh, but, uh, yeah, he uh, noted that there is another player that uh, is a signing that we will be very familiar with that will be announced uh, that, of course, uh, we will talk about in a second. But also uh, that Carlos Bogdan, he, he admitted that signing players for the sole purpose of selling them was a flawed strategy for Atlanta United. So just exactly what you were talking about. Uh, he said, quote, we had to evolve our model a little bit. Fascinating. Fascinating because, yeah, admitting that, uh, yeah, that is uh, maybe a fault is the first step, as they say. But, uh, yeah, you know, uh, in terms of that, I mean, do you feel like, you know, in terms of Carlos Bocanegra, is he learning? Is he uh, is he evolving? Is this uh, a lot of uh, Garth Lagerway steering the, the boat? What, what do you feel? Yeah, I think um, it would be interesting if you could see, you know, two realities separating at a fork in the road and see how one pans out and how the other also pans out. Fortunately, we can't do that, but it would be interesting to see what would happen if Carlos were left to his own devices, if he would keep going to that same well and continue with the business model we have been doing, or if he would have self-corrected on his own, or if perhaps in what some people suspect in this reality, um, Garth is more the one taking the helm and steering this in terms of changing the business model a bit, tweaking some things, and the result of that is them less going to South America, less going to Latin America, and more a focus on Europe. Um, so, I mean, 
I was hearing that you know South American players are also getting a little bit more expensive now. They and in the beginning when we got some of those players from the 2017 and 18 seasons, they were you know largely lightning in a bottle, um, like a flash in the pan. I don't think that you that that was exactly replicable. And I think that that's kind of what has happened. Granted, there were some variables with like the fact when you're an expansion team, you come in, you get a little bit more like money and room, wiggle room to do things. Um, whereas over time, that kind of fades away and you don't have those types of advantages that other teams that come into the league do. Um, so that's part of the reason why we had to dial things back. Winning the cup also getting rid of a lot of those players who came in under those kind those circumstances. We couldn't replace them like for like because of, you know, the not having those same uh, uh, things afforded to us as we did when we first started. Um, so what did that kind of, what was that essentially? I think that's lightning in a bottle that Carlos grabbed and he thought, man, if I could replicate this, we are going to be an incredibly profitable club and successful. Unfortunately, didn't seem to be the case. Seems like we need to do what most teams have figured out what we should be doing is a nice, you know, healthy sprinkling of players from a variety of places with varieties of experiences that can meld together. You know, the chemistry's got to be there, but people from different walks of life. And I think that that's what we're doing because, um, I mean, we haven't had what I like to call like, you know, well, I'll say right now, like sinew of our body. Like we have leadership in like the bones we have the muscle in our attacking prowess but we didn't really have the connective tissue that we needed to make it all work um after the 2018 season and a bit of the 19 once nagby left really um and our refilling of that midfield just never really happened so i think now signing of um some of the guys on the, in in the spine of the team starting with gregerson and then going into the guy we'll talk about in a minute um I think this is a perfect, you know, these muscles are being, the connective tissue is now there. So I expect to see this team to be significantly better next season. And not because we got all these superstars, but because now our superstars can finally function as they're meant to do. So I'm excited for it. Yeah, that, that was uh, awesome. And also the geekiest shit I've ever heard, <laughs> but <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. But, uh, yeah, it, it gave me a couple thoughts as well. That, uh, And here's the drink moment. Uh, Arsenal, in the uh, early 2000s, uh, there was a lot of French players that were brought in. I think made sense because of Arsene Wenger. You know, he's, uh, uh, at least at that moment, uh, yeah, you know, one of the most famous players. Uh, French managers to have come out of that country and uh, yeah he knew that league very well and he you know made the Premier League a lot more of a an international league uh, by bringing in and pretty much kind of taking advantage of the inefficiencies uh, in that league by you know bringing in players that he knew could play uh, and make a make an impact and uh, you know it's it's as well when you play like EAFC or you know of course what it was called FIFA, uh, you know if you ever play the season mode and you have scouts and you hire scouts in certain countries, it's a little bit similar to this. It seemed like we were only playing and maybe only affording ourselves one or two countries that we were actually scouting in. Uh, now it seems like a little bit more, although we're probably a little league uh, duh heavy, but it does seem like. Uh, yeah, you know, we're kind of varying it up now, and I think that's what's huge is uh, I think we have the resources to be able to, you know, send scouts out to various countries and take advantage of that, as well as use the analytics uh, that, you know, of course, have been implemented by uh, Garth Lagerwave. So uh, it is something that has needed to be done, and I'm super glad that we're making our way roads to making that a little bit more of a uh, a stronger case but but yeah uh so moving on from that uh lots of bits and bobs so let's uh 
you know, kind of roll through these. But uh, Bocanegra, he also confirmed that Ronald Hernandez has received his green card and Edward Mosquera is close to getting his as well. So, uh, yeah, international spots opening up for moves that we are making, of course. Uh, and, uh, yeah, as well, that uh, Carlos Bocanegra, he was asked if the club offered Miles Robinson... Robinson, the same one plus one contract link that he took with FC Cincinnati. Uh, and yeah, apparently, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, Boca, he did mention that uh, they were looking for something a little bit more long term in terms of the club. Uh, but Miles Robinson, he told Laurel Fowler, uh, who uh, is the beat writer for uh, FC Cincy. Uh, he mentioned that uh, in terms of the things that drew him to the club, so the atmosphere at TQL Stadium uh, being compared to European clubs was something he appreciated. Also, quote, I appreciate, obviously, the grass, the training ground, etc., etc. But, uh, ooh, you know, a lot of people took uh, some exception to that, uh, that grass statement. And obviously, the context of that... I mean, he did get injured on our turf. Uh, it did take him out of, uh, you know, being able to play at the World Cup. It is something that he probably had to weigh and maybe weigh into his decision of, okay, you know, play and ball out this year, uh, get a move for a, a bigger dollar amount that he was not receiving from Europe. Uh, and yeah, basically go from there. But uh, and also, you know, probably play in the Champions League and, you know, play on a team that, uh, you know, is pretty stacked. So definitely very interesting. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, the grass thing is it creeps up again, rears its ugly head. Um, you the know, grass is literally greener. Yeah, at, uh, maybe, man, damn, maybe. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, I mean, I, I don't fault him for wanting to play on grass. I mean. If you're going to ask any soccer player what they're going to prefer to do, they're going to prefer to play on grass 99% of the time. Um, so, you know, it is what it is. Um, if that if he factors that into, um, you know, why that was, you know, the reason he got his injury, I mean, that that's kind of, that makes sense. Um, but to say it out loud is a little kind of funny, but, you know, it's, who cares? It's not that big of a deal. Um, it, it's not like players are going to be looking at, uh teams that have turf in their stadiums as like pariahs or something like that it's it's not a big deal overall but it is like it is a, a slight thing that players consider and think about and when all things equal because essentially atlanta and cincinnati were um he just went well that one has grass and you know there's a couple other things but you know that that broke the tie essentially so um it is what it is it's fine um and I honestly, it's if he doesn't, if that reduces the chance of getting injured, I'm all for it because I want him to do well in the United States men's national team. So looking forward to seeing him play on that. One thing I thought was interesting, I was listening to Jason Longshore today too, and he was talking about that he had heard Carlos say something or someone say something along the lines of, yeah, they decided they got offers for Miles before the end of the season and they were you know not exactly large amounts of in terms of transfer fee but it was something um and the and carlos had said no because we want to keep miles in order to make a run in the playoffs um we all know how that ended but that was the idea and i'm curious to know what that team was was it psv like we thought um, a european team that can go into the champions league and things like that um with has a lot of american players already on it uh, which he's also been linked and rumored to in the past. So maybe that was the team. Not sure. But it's interesting that Carlos kept him on despite him getting an offer and also a transfer fee. So even though, you know, his contract was going out. Mm -hmm. And it's also that, I mean, it's uh, to one respect too. like I get why Boca would not make the move in season. I mean, uh, to bring somebody in to also integrate them into the squad. That takes time. It's not always immediate, as we saw with Abram, as we saw with other players, especially mid-season. That's pretty difficult. So, uh, yeah, you know, you have that continuity. You, he's one of the best players, uh, you know, on our team at that moment. Yeah, of course, I think you keep him. That's uh, especially, you know, that late. And, you know, him possibly still, you know, maybe... Uh, 
know, considering us in terms of, uh, you know, signing an extension. But yeah, I mean, I think you take that chance at that juncture, but uh, maybe at other junctures. Yeah, I don't know. But you know, situations uh, were a bit difficult as well with the injury, with his recovery, his rehab, uh, him getting back into form. So it's just, it, it was never a perfect situation for Miles Robinson and uh, that transfer. Other ones we can discuss at length, but we will not do so right now. But uh, yeah, uh, moving on from that, uh, yeah, in terms of the U22 designations, well, uh, Santiago Sosa and Franco Ibarra them being loaned, uh, at least Abara, he's official. Sosa, still that's happening, but uh, we'll see. It's uh, There is a little bit of complications, apparently. Uh, the uh, loan fee is a thing that uh, is the holdup for Santiago Sosa. Still sorting that out with the club that he is going to, Racing Club. But uh, yeah, the U22 designations will not be removed with the loans apparently so that isn't great that basically leaves us with only still the one with Edwin Mosquera and uh yeah I mean it also leaves in the air that's uh yeah Saba because he's a DP uh well he is tamable uh he'd be bought down but uh that if we need to bring in another full DP it would be if Almada leaves so because uh, your Yorko Sakumaki is probably not going to be leaving, I would say. Uh, so it would most likely be Almada uh, in terms of that. But yeah, these uh, th these funny and annoying U22 designations, uh, do you feel like it'll be a hindrance to our roster building in 2024? Uh, maybe. I don't think so. Things have seemed to have gone really smoothly in the offseason for us so far um i think we've hit on uh you know as far as what's public knowledge we seem to have hit on our targets pretty well um so i think we're in a we're in good shape um i mean for our starting 11 i i don't i i would think we have one of the best ones on paper in mls currently um our depth probably can use a little bit but like i don't know if u22 thing would uh, affect that considering typically you don't spend U22 spots on depth so um, yeah I don't think it'll be that big of a deal um, it's just it just it's confusing man I mean you, you talk to a lot of the pundits that talk uh, that cover the team and talk about it regularly and some of them are scratching their heads about what's with the U22 what, what did this mean for last year when we had you know Edwin loaned out and we had you know like it's it's weird that the designation doesn't go away if they're loaned. It's just, it's it's strange. I don't know how it works. Um, someone needs to write a book and publish it. Like, you know, MLS rules for dummies would be really helpful. So if they could get on that, it'd be great. Um, I they're would be the need, first one in line. The, yeah, they're going to need some uh, new additions every single year, though, because it changes a lot. It, so uh, it sounds like a lot of money coming in then. Right, exactly. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's definitely one of those things where... Um, yeah, hopefully it's not famous last words. So, uh, <laughs> in terms of it not being a problem, hopefully not. Uh, we shall see. We shall see. But uh, definitely, it could be a potential like hamstring if we see a player. We're like, oh, that'd be that'd be fantastic. But they're gonna make too much money. We can't do it. Uh, do we get rid of Edwin Mascara or something? Man, you know, I don't know. But. Uh, yeah, moving on from that, uh, Boker Neger, he spoke about the style of the uh, six that the club is looking for, in addition to Dax McCarty, who, of course, was uh, announced last week. Uh, noted that they wanted someone with a high soccer IQ that they can pivot uh, when needed in the attack, but can also act as the safety for the back four. Uh, mobility, like Muyumbo, was key, as was physicality and defensive acumen, which, uh, yeah, I think very much... Uh, Looks like uh, a player that we are uh, about to talk about. But before we get into that, there's just so much news. So, uh, yeah, Derek Williams, he was officially announced. Uh, he His deal uh, is finalized. He came in from the re-entry draft from DC United. Uh, and so, yes, definitely some depth on that left-hand side uh, as a left-footed center back. 
So definitely uh, Abram and Williams, we have some uh, experience there, and that's very, very good, along with, uh, you know, the likes of Noah Cobb and, uh, you know, Edwin Morales. Not Edwin. Uh, Efren. Morales. Efren. There we go. But, uh, and then, yeah, in terms of Tiago Almada, another transfer rumor. And, uh, yeah, his agent doing some work, it seems. But, uh, yeah, Fabrizio Romano, uh, the uh, kind of transfer-breaking extraordinaire. Uh, yeah, the he... Delphic Oracle of soccer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, that's, yeah, much better than what I said, I think. But, the uh, yeah, Almada, he's apparently one of the top names on Atletico Madrid's list in case Angel Correa, uh, if he leaves the club, uh, apparently, Al Itihad, uh, the Saudi Arabian club, has approached uh, or will approach Atleti for Correa. And Tiago Mata has always been appreciated by Atleti. Uh, his name is very high on the club's list, apparently. And uh, yeah, Tiago Mata even uh, on some uh, social media stuff when he, because uh, he's currently with Argentina. Caleb Wiley is, of course, with the U.S. men's national team. But uh Amada, he was talking to uh, media and he was asked which club that he likes the most and he said Atletico Madrid, which, you know, are they courting each other? Are they just openly, uh, you know, twerking for each other in public? Possibly. But, you know, uh, it is one of these things where, so apparently, according to the club, uh LA United has not received any offers yet for Tiago Almada. So, you know, uh, I think they're just maybe feeling out those uh, those offers. You know, maybe uh, it hasn't rained yet, <laughs> if we're going to go along with this metaphor. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, we'll see, we'll see. But that obviously would mean a big, big miss in the middle of our lineup if uh, Tiago Almada is sold. Uh, but if there's a, time to do it it's probably now <laughs> so that we're not blindsided uh, a little later on in the preseason and uh yeah i mean you would hope that the club has some uh other players that they are eyeing in the case that they do uh because well as of the 17th there's a little bit of time before the window ends it's not a lot but it could be it could be very very uh very huge news if it were. But uh, what, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know. The Atletico thing, It's if, if it happens, I, I don't. Who knows if it's going to happen? It, you need dominoes to fall first before that to even be a thing. So we'll kind of wait and see, you know, uh, standby positions um, for that one. Um, you know, it's... It, for just first of all, it'd be cool if he went there. It'd be an interesting club for to follow and watch him uh, play for. Uh, that would be cool. Um, thing is, is you, like you said, you, you know, you getting rid of him in the middle of a season or something would be really, really tough on us. He's the linchpin of our of our team. Um, like the thing is, I don't think you're like if you. Yeah, of course the club's gonna have targets to to try and re, you know replace Tiago and his output, but I don't think you you're not gonna find another Tiago Almada. I don't no. think so. It's gonna be tricky. Um, I, I mean, as long as, as long as you get like a like someone who can get up to seventy five percent of what Tiago's one hundred percent is, you're still gonna be very good. You're still going to be dangerous. Um, and who knows, they might even somehow with their other intangibles like their chemistry or whatever might even sync better with the team. You never know. Um, and it could perhaps make up for some of the, you know, him just not hitting stupid long goals out of nowhere, you know, or something like that. Because that's definitely a Tiago type of talent that not a lot of people have. Um, so, you know, it's, I don't know, um, when it comes to that rumor, you know, how likely it is, we'll have to wait and see. And it I, I i hope it's it happens because it's gonna happen i just hope it happens when it's not super disadvantageous for us it doesn't catch us with our pants down um but you know i mean it is what it is i don't i want to do right by him don't want him to be disgruntled 
We want pe players to look to Atlanta United and say this is a pathway to the highest levels of soccer and before we of course get there so um you know it's yeah i guess that's that's pretty much it we will see uh how this plays out right and almada i mean if you went to atletico madrid it's a i mean that's a very good club to to mm -hmm. go to uh champions league level uh a team that you know is in shouts of winning the league at times if it's not barcelona and real madrid so it is you know i would say if uh you go to a la liga club that ain't too bad i would uh i would go there if i were him uh but uh <laughs> yeah ultimately yeah it uh does this gut us it would uh and that's the most important thing is how do we replace his production and uh it might not be with one player but uh you know there are cases where some teams where if they were too reliant on one player now they're spreading out you know the uh, the production it actually opens it up where you know every member of the team does feel a little bit more uh not only productive but more part of the team could be good could be uh yeah. i mean you know. we're, we're not going to get a like for like i don't think with tiago like i said but i mean you look at columbus you know middle of their season they get rid of Zellerian and then they pick up Diego Rossi and they don't miss a step and end up going on to win the cup So I mean just because you lose your quote-unquote best player doesn't necessarily doom you so I think um, You know just because he's, he's gonna leave it's inevitable. We'll just see You know enjoy him while he's here and then we'll work on something to get his replacement in that I think will you know he will he will whoever this player is will be able to do enough that the loss of Thiago won't be like a historically painful event for Atlanta United, I think. Right. Indeed, indeed. Well, uh, yeah, the time has come. <laughs> Bartos Slish, he is officially an Atlanta United player. And uh, yeah, we don't know his number yet, but uh, that, uh, that alluding tweet to, or ex post, whatever you want to call it now, uh, where it said loading, uh, it went to number 99. And uh, yeah, there's uh, some eagle-eyed uh, Reddit users that noticed that uh, that's probably what they're referring to uh, because Schlich, he wears number 99, uh, at least for his former club, Lijo Warsaw, uh, who apparently got $3.5 million for... Uh, their troubles for the transfer fee, which is uh, a little bit more than uh, what initially was reported, but uh, they got their, their fee, they got uh, their demands, and the Polish midfielder, the 24-year-old, is now an Atlanta United player. Uh, welcome to Schlich. Uh, welcome to Schlich, to Atlanta, rather. And uh, But yes, uh, yeah, this player, six caps with Poland. Uh, yeah, he's won two titles with Legia. And, uh, I mean... He might be exactly what we need. I mean, he's a player that uh, looks like he can play that sixth position also as well uh, in the midfield at various other uh, positions of need uh, if needed. Uh, decent size at 5'11", or you know, wherever you look. Uh, he might be a little bit different of a size, but uh, seems like a good contrast to Muyumba who uh, might be 5'4", dripping wet. But, um, you know, it is definitely a player that uh, looks like he can bring a lot of different things. Uh, mobility, uh, kind of that uh, bulldogginess, the ability to break up play, uh, you know, pretty good on the ball as well. Uh, looks like a player that can uh, be that guy who uh, kind of anchors our midfield from uh, deep and boy did we need that i mean we needed somebody like him and uh ooh, i mean not a dp and uh his uh contract goes to 2028 which yeah five-year deal that's pretty great like uh, i think we've uh locked up somebody that in the long term uh a 24 year old i mean you know coming from a team that you know played in various uh top level competitions uh, probably the you know type of club that uh, is like the you know PSGs, Bayern Munichs, uh, Galatasarays of the world, where you know there's not a ton of competition, but still, it is uh, a guy f coming from a big club in Europe 
So, uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on Bartosz Slich becoming finally an Atlanta United player? Yep, a new player um, in the Garth Lagerway era. Uh, the Lagerwayians are starting to amass and starting to um, show us what, you know, the idea that Garth had in his head for this team is. And I think... I'm liking it so far. I mean, if we got a taste of it last year towards the end of the season, I'm excited to see what this can do in the next season. Um, Sleesh is, um, you know, it, it, I'll give credit to uh, Sydney. I was listening to him earlier today um, over at Scars and Spikes. He said something interesting about, you know, this is this is not exactly a guy who's going to, like, light the league on fire. You know, he's not a DP-level player. Um, and granted, some teams around MLS have DP level sixes and eights and stuff. So, and you've seen them do well. And what have we been saying on this show also for the longest time? We need a DP or something along those lines to really set us apart from a lot of the other teams at MLS. Um, these are like, you know, cup questing teams. Um, and we want to be there too. I really was hoping that we could get a high level six and eight, and we did with Tristan. I think, you know, obviously these are not DPs, but they're they are operating almost at that level. And I'm, so this is a great bit of business with Tristan, and I hope it's a great bit of business with Sleece as well. Um, but again, Sydney reminds us, you know, this guy's not going to set the league on fire. Um, I hope he performs in an above average stat, uh, state. Um, in terms of MLS average sixes, I think he will. I hope he will. He kind of needs to if we want to win a championship. So I'm looking forward to him developing with us and kind of tapping into his next level. And I mean, he's in his prime. He's getting into his prime too. I mean, he's not even fully there yet. So that's a great bit of business as well. The fact that, you know, we're not just having older players come in and younger players come in. We're getting guys in their peak with experience they can hit the ground running and that was another concern that we used to you know shot us in the foot many years in a row about how we would get players in and they would have to take like a whole season to get adjusted these guys are not like that they're coming right in they're tested they're proven and they hit the ground running so that's not really a concern i have and boy i'm happy we don't have to worry about that as much anymore um so yeah this guy he seems like so far the real deal he seems like he'll be able to ameliorate a lot of the problems that we've seen. Um, if you look at his statistics, his forward-mindedness, his progressive play, you know, the uh, just the uh, his his um, willingness to take the ball and then to find a slicing type of pass, um, you know, that cuts open defenses and midfields, bypasses multiple lines, um, puts a team in disarray, starting from the sixth position. I mean, we got players now in multiple areas of the field, through levels of the field, that can do this type of dissecting another team. And if you're constantly unbalanced all the time, you're gonna be you're gonna be running around, you know, exhausting yourself, out of position, disjointed. You can get hurt pretty badly by a team that has a lot of firepower like we do. So, I I mean, I love it. Um, is he going to be a, the difference changer for us? I don't think so, necessarily. However, the fact that I feel like we haven't really had, um, like, um, not even like, I feel like we've had like less than serviceable midfield for like a while. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason why I haven't had as much success. With Tristan, definitely at least serviceable, probably more, I would say. And Sleeves, the addition of that might even be more as well. And at that point, you have serviceable guys making you into like a championship team because all the rest of us is so darn good. Um, so I'm really expecting a lot from this team. Um, you know, this, maybe the signings aren't these big flashy ones that MLS likes to dote around um, or, you know, post about like, oh, Atlanta United signed XYZ and, and but you know, these guys, I think, will get the job done and they're going to surprise people. It's like, oh, it's a guy from League of Warsaw or, you know, like uh, from the from Poland. Like, who is this? And all of a sudden he's stopping people, you know, um, Stian Gregerson, all of a sudden he's stopping people. He's from League Two. What? Uh, that's what I'm expecting to see next season, because people, Tristan, Sande, Saba, surprise the heck out of the league. And I'm expecting these guys to do the same thing. 
Love it, man. Yeah, and it's uh, it's also uh, a little bit of this where, um, yeah, Schleesh, uh I think with what he offers, uh, you know, for the guys in front of him, I think that's the huge part is that they're not having to probably, uh, you know, really work backwards as much in the past, and that's something that we've needed. Uh, and it's that. It's like, you know, if we can actually play through our midfield... <laughs> That'd be incredible. Like we've we've been missing that for some time, and uh, I think you know Sleesh he will bring that ability to be able to actually play through people's uh, other teams' midfields. But as well, uh, another thought on uh, you know why Sleesh has come to uh, MLS. I mean you know obviously he's only played in Poland, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's one of these things where. Uh, you know, this this league might just offer him something a little bit different, a change of scenery that uh, with Ligia Warsaw, they, they're they that club that, you know, they're always winning. It's, like I said, PSG, Bayern Munich. The, uh, you know, you, you want something a little bit more of a challenge. And, uh, you know, MLS where, I mean, let's not discount that Lionel Messi is still playing here. Like, that... That bit, I think, is you know attracting a lot of uh, other players as well. They want to see if they can uh, you know kind of play in this league and um, you know play with uh, the best player ever. I mean, yeah, I think uh, there's some attractiveness in doing that, uh, and especially if you can top him, like you can say that in your career. Like when you when you're on your deathbed, you're like, I faced off against Lionel Messi, and uh, you know we finished higher than them in the league or something like that. Or we beat them, like that's <laughs> on I mean, a on a balmy <laughs> Saturday night in Atlanta. Exactly. Right, that's exactly. right. Exactly. <laughs> so you know, let's not discount that either. I think there is uh, a bit of that. But uh, yeah, so you know, Schlees, welcome to Atlanta, and uh, hopefully you can uh, you know take uh, take us to some heights that uh, we are hoping you can. But uh, next bit of news is, uh, yeah, really bad for River Plate and Pete Martinez, of course, a former uh, Five Stripe, but uh, he uh, returned to his uh, club uh, that he uh, originated from, and yeah, unfortunately, he suffered uh, an ACL injury to his left knee. Uh, just another one for Martinez, and. It's a bummer. Um, yeah, definitely wish him the best. Uh, but yeah, it is, man, that's sad to see. You definitely want to wish, you know, former players the best. And P.D. Martinez just does not get the the uh, the best luck, unfortunately. But um, yeah, and uh, last bit of news is that LNI 2, they have signed our super draft pick, Jaden Hibbert. Uh, yeah, he went from Kentucky, of course. And uh, yeah, the goalkeeper will now, uh, yeah, make his, uh, I guess, strides for LA United 2 to try to get into the first team. But, uh, yeah, welcome to Hibbert. Uh, but, yeah, that is the news, and that gets us into the mailbag. And you guys send in these questions through IG Story. Please continue to do so, and we might answer your question in the future. So, uh, first question comes from How I Met Your Bourbon. Why is Guzan coming back? You know what I mean? I'm going to dive into that one. We're going to dive into that one. That's the first question. <laughs> All right. I mean, he's back because, like, I don't know what, I don't know why it's really a question. I mean, because you need, you need goalkeepers. <laughs> so we have three. Uh, and that's what we need. We need a stable of goalkeepers. Um, and then you know we need we need veterans we need newbies and we need kind of the middle of the you know the run kind of guys and we got all of that so i mean like i i feel like when people say these things about guzan they're like afraid he's gonna start every game and i just don't think that that's the case i don't i think you can put that worry to bed um i think he's not gonna start every game He's going to have to fight for his spot, and I think Josh is more incapable of winning plenty of uh, starts over him. And if he's not, then that's really, really worrying. <laughs> so, I mean, like, if Brad ends up being the number one for most games, I mean, we pretty much missed the mark on Josh then, and that really stinks. Um, but I, I don't foresee that being an issue. 
Um, yeah, I think you need uh, you need three goalkeepers. Brad is good with experience, great guy in the locker room. That's still valuable. That's still helpful. Um, and great mentor for Josh coming in. And, you know, I think that they will share responsibilities. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, we don't know how good Brad can be if he's not having to play every game. He could be that, like, you limit him to half of a season, essentially. Um, you know, like 16 games or something. Or, you know, that's that's a lot, I would say. But let's just imagine 16 games. He Maybe he does even better per game because he's not playing every game. Maybe he rests every other week or something like that. I don't know. I don't know what it's going to be. But I have a feeling that it won't be bad. It just won't be. It definitely won't be like previous years. I think he'll probably even improve. So we'll see. Um, with less stress and less um, pressure on him. Um, yeah, and I think he'll make Josh a better goalkeeper overall, too. Yeah, the competition for places uh, probably will be a good thing. The thing, though, is uh, I think you're seeing that at Arsenal right now is like having two starting level goalkeepers. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think Josh Cohen more or less is the bona fide uh, you know, starting keeper is just the for optics as well as uh, you know, Brad Guzan, uh apparently has been taking a bit of a pay cut every season for a little bit of time now uh, to be able to incorporate others into uh, the squad. Uh, and Brad Guzan, I mean, it's like, yeah, I don't. I think in the teens, that's a lot of games probably. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. Like think I that's, said, overestimation. Yeah. yeah. Right, and I think that's the thing. It's like Brad Guzan is. Um, like as a goalkeeper, like you don't need, you don't need maybe rest uh, per se. It's a, you know, it's the the least uh, taxing position on the pitch for sure. Uh, I mean, mentally maybe uh, it might be a thing, but I think ultimately, yeah, Josh Cohen, um, you know, he is the heir apparent to that position, and uh, Braggazan will offer a lot of experience, veteran presence. Uh, and, uh, you know, might be able to help uh, kind of fill in some gaps for Josh Cohen uh, if there are anything that uh, he needs to know, uh, you know, kind of from the mental standpoint. But, uh, but yeah, uh, next question comes from, uh, let's see, uh, Javier Martin 9, is this going to be another poor season? I, I don't think so. I think everything we've talked about today and maybe in some previous episodes have highlighted the reasons why we don't think it'll be a poor season. Um, I, I would be shocked if it was a poor season. Um, like, towards the end of last season, we did really well. We were beating teams, sometimes convincingly, extremely convincingly. Uh, we were going toe-to-toe -to -toe with playoff-level teams. We were doing well against them um we were putting teams to the sword sometimes too and i think that we showed a lot of growth and a lot of improvement with not only the players that we have but with the new guys coming in and that was huge all the players kind of recognize it too when you hear about them in their interviews they talk about how you know that transfer window changed everything so um you know i think that was the start that was the appetizer next season and then you, I mean, Yorgos even mentioned this in his, his presser recently that, you know, they had, they had what, like six months together? Teams need time to gel. I think next season, I mean, and then growing into this next season as well, they're going to look like a way more cohesive and effective unit together. Um, so I think these are all reasons to be optimistic for this season. Um, but yeah, we didn't sign a messy level player. I don't think we need to. I think we'll be fine. I think, like I said, our starting 11 is among the best in the league, I believe, on paper. So we'll see how, how it shakes out. But I, I don't really see a lot out there that's going to give me, like, a reason to think we're not going to challenge for the top four spot in the East. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, well said. And it's, it's really that. It's like, uh, I think we're, you know, at least the record that we had at uh, the end of the transfer window uh, in the summer to the end of the season, we were one of the best teams uh, in the league for sure. And, um, you know, I think once we can solve that away record a little bit, and I think, you know, with a, a better team, <laughs> you can solve that a little bit better. 
uh, and with more depth, uh, that definitely can change kind of uh, how we're going to look ultimately. But yeah, I mean, I don't think in any sense that, uh, you know, either of us think that it's going to be a poor season. And goes right into our next question, which uh, from ATL underscore, uh, underscore Lee Dog. Uh, they ask, what is your prediction this season and new players? Where do we stand in the table or with new players? Uh, where do we stand in the table? Uh, well, let's actually preface that. Uh, yeah, we will actually get into a larger episode in that uh, before the season starts. But uh, a very, very, very bird's eye view. Uh, you know, I think uh, Michael already mentioned a little bit. Yeah, fourth, fourth or higher in the table. I think definitely is something that uh, I think is achievable with this team at the moment. Uh, if Almada leaves, that might change a little bit of that. But uh, I think, yeah, you know, we uh, we have every bit of I think starting eleven to compete with the best in the league, uh, and you know that's even with Lionel Messi. You know that that team is going to be good. That, if, that's going to be annoying, but. Uh, yeah, uh, in terms of uh, the an, another question, uh, let's see, let's see, we got three Diego four. Uh, he said, "Who should be captain if Guzan isn't starting?" I think we mentioned it in a previous episode, uh, and uh, you can check that out. Uh, our in-depth thoughts on that, but uh, you know, I think the obvious ones uh, would be Lennon would be Yorgos Yakomakis. Uh, yeah, there might be a new guy that uh, might get a look, possibly. Uh, maybe Steon Gregerson, if there are uh, moments where both of them might be out. But, uh, yeah, I think or those Dax. two are, Yeah, or Dax, exactly. That's a great shout as well, if he's playing. Um, and so, yeah, it's definitely... There's, I think, no shortage of candidates, but uh, I think Guzan probably, if he's still in the club, he will be the overall club captain, and the uh, player that's, uh, you know, on the pitch will be uh, kind of the de facto. But um, yeah, thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I I think Lennon deserves it. Um, I mean, all these other players have the capability. You know, they're they're kind of natural leaders that we mentioned. Um, so it'll be interesting to see over the lifetime, you know, how long they stay here, who leaves and who comes in. Um, you know, if Lennon, you know, leaves in the next like one year or two, don't see it happening, but like, let's say he does, like some of these other guys could fulfill that role pretty quickly and easily. Um, I mean, again, this is the Garth era. These Lager, Lager Wayans who have come in are, uh, you know, very capable players of being able to take on a leadership role it seems like right from the bat a lot of them were leaders in their own right at their previous clubs so like it's there it's proven it's tried it's tested so you know it's going to be interesting it's almost as if like it's an embarrassment of riches it's like at what point do you have too many leaders is that an issue is that a problem <laughs> so yeah, right exactly that's uh no that's what you want is a club of former captains that's that's usually a good thing. And then you have the alpha who, uh, yeah, will pretty much uh, lead the men. So, uh, yeah, definitely a good thing there. Um, yeah, next question comes from Crisco25. Uh, you think we have enough backups with Morales and Cobb as center backs, or do we need more? Uh, obviously, Derek Williams is in the fray as well, as well as Gregerson. So you have uh, five guys, probably need maybe one more guy uh, to kind of uh, fill out that, you know, two starting level ones, two, uh, you know, more academy type guys, and then a uh, league veteran. I think that's a pretty decent uh, depth, but yeah, possibly one more guy on the right-hand side that uh, has a little bit more experience. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. Uh, maybe one, maybe one. Mm -hmm. uh, I, if they go after one of these, it's not going to be like a a crazy signing. It'll probably be like another Derek Williams type type of signing. So I think it won't be you know anything crazy. Um, but you know, interestingly enough, I think Atlanta United has hinted at another signing that they're going to do soon, and they haven't mentioned the position or a name or any kind of rumors involved with this person. So. I'd be curious to see where they go. I mean, we are 
a little thin at left back if we're gonna you know play with left backs which i believe we will um so there might be a guy coming in to help out caleb wiley on the left side so we'll see keep your eyes open yeah and that leads us to our last question which uh apropos uh planes go kaboom that's uh, terrible but uh wow uh but the uh the name uh aside he asks now with schlees in what do you think is the biggest hole in our team you had mentioned it, uh, left back perhaps. I mean, yeah, you know, Ronald Hernandez uh, can play on the right and the left. Uh, some defensive prowess uh, to be desired, but uh, definitely uh, a guy that can play in this league and can help uh, in the depth department. But yeah, maybe a little bit more of a left-sided one as well because we're not really inverting our fullbacks or at least, uh, you know, as, as of now that we know. But, uh, yeah, it is something that's, yeah, is a fairly large, uh, large glaring hole, especially if uh, Wiley has to play, uh, you know, some games with uh, the national team. He will be away. What are, what are we going to do? You know, we need some, uh, some good depth that can actually start in this league. So, um, yeah, you know, that uh, I think we definitely still need more midfielders. Uh, we have really only still about three or four. We probably need about a maybe uh, a rotation of about six guys. So yeah, definitely. If uh, there are some other players that can um, you know come in, I think that can help fill the coffers a bit uh, in terms of the depth department. What do you think? Yeah, let me let me try and answer this question a little bit differently um, because yeah, I think you answered it already um in that way but let's look at it like well what's our biggest hole in terms of like how can teams hurt us if we have our you know desired starting 11 out which conceivably we know what it's going to be starting the season um you know theoretically speaking where would t so if yeah if you're like a spy for another team this is where you turn the stream off real fast just saying but anyway um where would like another team potentially hurt us right now um, I would say down our, well, the other, the opponent's right side, but our left side, defensively speaking, because that's where you have Caleb Wiley and that's where you have Luis Abram. Abram can be gone after uh, uh, because of his inability to keep up with, like, you know, extremely pacey um, attackers on counterattacks, long balls, and things of that sort. Um, he can be easily exposed that way that's worrying to me it was worrying last year it's still worrying to this year um stan will do a lot to help with that but i think that they'll target luis um and then going down and trying to prey on poor caleb wiley i mean they're gonna try and do that as well i believe because i think caleb is going to try and do what he does often which is come up and help with the attack and running all the way back yeah he's still young but like that's taxing and eventually towards you know the, the latter half of the game he may not be able to make those runs as much so then you already have a slow center back on the left side and a tired left back that can't get back in time that's a pretty weak side that can shape up over there throughout the course of a game and that worries me especially with a sub like a you know a uh, like a striker sub substitute from the other team that has fresh legs and is very fast or a winger that could be very scary so i think that that's probably where i would like to think like it's to answer this in this way um that's where the hole might be for us um tactically speaking and so i think that that's you know where we're gonna have to it'll be interesting to see if there's we could get a left back that can challenge caleb for his position um and not just be like purely depth but you know it we'll see what what shakes out on that position but yeah that's the only area that really you know besides that i don't really see a position or an area on the field or on our team that's super concerning to me i feel like we're really stacked pretty much everywhere and don't get me wrong even though i identified that as our quote unquote weak spot i don't think it's that weak it's still fairly good compared to a lot of other teams in MLS. Um, like Luis and Caleb are very capable. So even so, 
that may be like where they try and hit us. I don't think it's necessarily weak, but perhaps weaker? Maybe. We'll see. Because Stian seems to be really, really good. Yeah. And it's that. It's a. Uh... Like uh, we've been alluding to and talking about, it's you are only as strong as the weakest link in your side, and in that, uh, yeah, that's yeah. If I were the other team, I would be targeting that as well. So, uh, yeah, I, I agree that those are areas that we can possibly uh, maybe uh, kind of bring in some uh, competition for places that will make it a lot uh, maybe more at ease for any concern but yeah uh definitely you know i think we still have a good bit of the uh the transfer window left to fill out those positions so yeah looking forward to what that will be in the future so guys uh that is pretty much the episode except for the question of the day and the question of the day is which new signing are you most excited about uh, we've made a flurry of moves, and yeah, uh, there's some exciting uh, moves in the back. Which one do you feel like will uh, make the most impact? Uh, which one are you the most excited about? Let us know. Let us know in the comments below. But uh, Mike, do you have uh, an answer for that? Um, I mean. I, I it's tough because I I like them I like Stan and and um and Sleece probably like equally at this point they they both seem to be what we need and really exciting players to have to fill out those spots um I think probably Sleece a little bit more just because I think uh, the like the the flow of the team will rely more on him than Stian will because he's more, you know, for defense purposes, obviously. Um, but seeing the number, the new number six affect the attack for us uh, going forward, I think will be very exciting. Um, and I mean, AJ and I have been clamoring for a, a gifted player in this position for a while now. So um, hopefully he's the, you know, the real McCoy and um, we're looking forward to it. Indeed, indeed. So yeah, let us know in the comments below what you have to say. Looking forward to what your thoughts are. But guys, that's it. That's the video there and there. Remember to like, share, comment, subscribe. I've been AJ. That's been Michael. And we'll see you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching.